Hello, the chairs. Good afternoon. Uh, I think we had a reading club yesterday, right? But for today, we don't have enough time. Uh, yesterday, we didn't have a reading club because there were only two members. I think most people were very happy for New Year activity. That's why today I will be alone who will be leading for a reading club. Okay, so let's get started, everyone. Uh, today, we are going to focus on two different chapters. The very first one is chapter 19. Chapter 19 is about... Um, uh, writing, how you are going to teach writing to your students. And second one is chapter 20. Chapter 20 is about how you're going to teach your students about speaking. So actually they are very interesting units, but uh, there were only two members yesterday. So if you are free, please come and join our reading club every Wednesday and Saturday, you are free to join for that reading club. Okay, uh, now the book we are focusing is The Predicts of English Language Teaching. Uh, if you want to look at your book page number, you can have a look at page number 323. 323. Yeah. So now let's start. Okay, so related to writing, writing is a kind of productive skill, right? That's why uh, whenever we are talking about something, uh, whenever we are talking about writing, it's really important to take into consideration about reading. Only when we have reading in perception, we can ask our students to produce their writing skill. Right. OK, so now the, let's start with the basic one, which is mentioned on page number three to four, page three to four. The first one is spelling. So when we talk about writing, it's really important for us to think about how much is it important? Nowadays, I think most of the kids and most of the teachers, including us, might say like, oh, spellings are not important because uh, we can have different types of electronic dictionary. And also the students, they hardly ever have to write with their hand. They have to use most of their writing based on the computer, laptop, and it's like auto corrected version. So it, even if you have like some spelling mistakes, people can understand that, right? Because uh, it, it will be like changed automatically. That's why most of the kids nowadays, they think like writing is not very important, especially for spelling. Spelling is not that important. Okay, if so, uh, let's have a quiz. Um, now, I think you might see my word. Can you see? Uh, yeah. So do you know this word? C-A-L-E and D-A-R. You know that, right? Calendar, calendar. So where can we see that one? We can find different types of calendar and then it usually shows about the month and also about the date and day. Okay, so what about this one? C-A-L-E-N-D-E-R. The spelling is not the same, right? D-A-R and D-E-R. What about the difference between them? Calendar and calendar. Is it the same or different? It's totally different, right? C-A-L-E-N-D-A-R. If we spell with D-A-R, it means uh, the calendar that we can see every day. For example, if you want to know about some events, maybe the ninja holiday, and when will the holidays be? At that time, you can look at the calendar and you can know about the take, some time, and everything. But for this one, it's not a noun form, actually, right? It's a kind of verb form, and uh, it's a kind of suit the clothes. For example, you go to the tailor shop, and then you suit different types of clothes, you're trying to ask them to make different types of design. So the meaning is totally different. So can we say the spelling is not important? No way, right? Okay, so now uh, let's look at another example. Um, this one, what is it? Physics, physics. We all know that, right? It's a kind of subject, life science subject, like uh, chemistry, mathematics, physics, biology, blah, 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 like that. But some of the people, they usually drop as in here. So at the time, what could the meaning be? Is it still the same? No, it's totally different. It's a kind of medicine, which can make you go to toilet a lot. For example, you eat a lot of sticky rice, and then uh, you cannot go to toilet, and something is stuck into your stomach. At that time, when you take the physic, you feel really relaxed, and you really want to go to the toilet. So the meaning is totally different, right? One is subject, and another one is um, sub, uh, another one is a kind of medicine which can be really good for your stomach. 
Uh, yes, it's here. You're correct. Okay, thank you, it's here. Soap also, we have different types of soap. The one we, when we take a bath, we can use those soap, right? S-O-A-P soap. And also soap opera, it's also another meaning, drama series or things like that. So we have different types of things. And that's why the spelling is also very important. And some students, whenever they spell something, soap and soup, S-O-U-P soup and S-O-A-P soap, they make such kind of spelling mistake. So at that time, the meaning can be totally different. That's why spelling is also kind of very important for our students to improve. So when we consider about writing, we can also think about such kind of uh, spelling mistake as well. So it's already mentioned in page three, two, four as well. Now you can have a look at page number three, two, five. It's about uh, layout and punctuation, layout. So how much is it important for layout? Yeah, it's totally important. For example, suppose you're going to uh, give a love letter to your crush. At that time, uh, if you prepare your, how do you say, letter with different types of A5 paper or A4 paper, would it be okay? No, right? It's really plain and it's really long. So during this era, nobody wants to read love letter like that. So if you want to give the love letter to your crush at that time, you can change your layout design, maybe a little bit a uh, cute one. And also instead of having like A4 or A5 paper, you can even like uh, create some of the very, very thin paper or very short paper. In this way, your crush will love you back. <laughs> so layout is also kind of very important. And also when you are thinking about email writing. So suppose you have to send the email to someone at the time your letters might be very long. If the letter is very long, we automatically know that we have to do the attachment file, right? But sometimes uh, some people, they write a very long letter even in email. So at that time, the layout is not okay for that. That's why when we write, uh, when we ask the students to do writing, layout also, we have to consider about that. It's very important for them. And another one is punctuation. Punctuation also, right? Basically, um, the students make the mistake on uh, full stop uh, and also semicolon and different types of things. This is also very important. If we are making mistake, the meaning can be totally wrong. So these are some basic things we all have already known. It's already mentioned in that book as well. Uh, when we talk about writing, we have to consider two types of approaches. It's very important. The first one is product writing. And second one is process writing. So these are two writing stages. Um, think about your childhood, maybe in grade seven or grade nine. At the time, which one did you learn first? For example, to be able to write the letter, how did you learn first? Did you think about same idea first or did you think about the layout design first? Normally layout design, right? And uh, we used to learn like, okay, if we put the address at the right corner and then if we put dia, blah, 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 blah. How are you? I hope you're well, as for me, I'm fine. And at the end of your letter, if you can include yours leveling, at that time, you are likely to get three marks, right? We look at the framework, sometimes we don't have any ideas to write. But at that time, we try to put uh, those framework and we get the three marks. Oh yeah, we are very happy. It's like end of the product. This is, we got product writing. We are not focusing on any ideas. But if you really want to focus on the ideas, uh, you can ask your students uh, to start thinking about step by step. For example, step one, you give a topic to your students. Do you think your students will be able to write every single thing as soon as they see the topic? No way, they can write. They can actually write because they need a sort of thinking skill. So we can start with the brainstorming section. For example, you give a topic to your student. As soon as they see the topic, they start thinking about some ideas. Oh, what are we going to write? Are we going to write about visiting to the supermarket or visiting to the, uh, how do you say, zoo or things like that? They just think about some ideas. Their ideas are like scattered, spreading everywhere and then they just write a draft. Only after they have written the draft, they select, oh, I will put this idea when I'm writing. Oh, this one, I don't really like it. I will leave it out. Redrafting, step by step. And then you can also put editing stage. Uh, for example, after they have written something, you can ask your students, okay, everyone, please check your writing back. Do you make any spelling mistake or grammar mistake in your writing? So you usually end up your writing, detailed writing stage with proofreading skill, 
proofreading is like we ask our students to check every single point in detail. So that's why uh, process writing is also very important. Actually, when we are teaching writing to our students, we should do that stage first. Only after they have got uh, how to write according to the procedure, they will be very systematic and they can end up with their product. And then after they have got the whole piece, they can put in a one framework. If it is for email writing, they can put uh, according to the email writing framework. If it is for postcard writing, they can even think about, okay, how shall we write the postcards? They can put another framework on their own. So project writing is like a shell only, like a shell. There is nothing inside. You know the egg, right? When we are eating the egg, uh, which one do you like most? <laughs> the inner one or outer one? <laughs> inner one, right? Inner one is more delicious. It can make you how to say, feel energetic and it can be really good for your health as well. Like that, when we are teaching writing to our students, project writing, outer face is not very important. We have to start with the inner one. In this way, our students will be able to write something very well. So if you want to know about product writing and process writing in detail, you can have a look at page number 325 and 326. Uh, they tell you about different types of exercises for teaching writing. Actually, it's a really nice exercise. If you really want to put effort on your teaching, you better read uh, this chapter. It's a really nice one. And another point we have to consider is about genre. It's on page number 327. Genre is also very important in teaching, especially for project writing framework. Uh, genre is like types of writing. For example, are they going to write a novel? poem or postcard, anything. So different types of writing have different styles, right? Um, uh, for example, if you are writing postcard, you don't, you are not likely to use a uh, formal writing style, right? You would just use informal and a little bit persuasive word. It's also kind of a uh, difference between product writing and process writing. We can put uh, different types of genre technique, especially in product writing. So, Page number 327, you can have a look at it. Page number 327, genre. For some teachers, they usually try to practice with guided writing technique. For example, especially for the young learners, they don't know the writing structure yet. They have ideas, but they don't know the framework exactly. At that time, you can just show the sample model of writing to your student. Uh, for example, uh, you start with the postcard writing, right? At that time, you write the postcard writing as an example. And then you just show your student and the students read your sample one. After they have read your sample one, you, you let them write with another one. For another one, you give like uh, some of the blanks. For example, if I write dia susu, but I'm not giving dia susu to my students. I just give like dia blah, 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 blah. At that time, they just have to fill in the gap. They can fill in the gap, right? Because firstly, I just show them the model and then they have got an idea. Based on that idea, they will be able to write it back with their own way. Like that, step by step, we call our students to write in a framework. This is what we call a generic approach, generic approach, different types of writing techniques to our students. So in this way, you can give the guideline to your students and they will be able to write on their own way, little by little. Maybe like step one, you show the model. Step two, you give the gap to your students little by little. And then step three, uh, step three is like, you try to, how do you say, delete some of the paragraph. And then step four, you just give the title to your student. At that time, they just have to start writing. And they don't feel, uh, how to say, they don't feel nervous or they don't feel anxious about that because you have already given them different types of models, different types of guided writings. That's why they have some ideas to start writing. Okay, so now another one, another one is about creative writing. If your students can write something very well, if the students know about some uh, writing technique for email writing, generic writing, article writing, after they have known those things, we have to focus on creative writing, which is very important, especially for those students who are above intermediate level. At that time, you can start with different types of analogy, and you can also show your student for example, you just give the word to your students. Uh, okay, uh, firstly, you make the students into different pairs. Okay, you two work together, you two work together, you two work together. You give like that. 
And then uh, after that one finish, what you can try is like, um, okay, so this pair, uh, can you give me one of the nouns you like most? At the time, this pair gave you like, it's here, I like the most L-O-V-E love. At the time, you write L-O-V-E love on the whiteboard. And another pair, they also have to think about one of the nouns or one of the adjectives they like most. After you have collected all of their ideas, you just uh, write them on a whiteboard. Actually, those ideas are not related to each other, but the students, they have to connect all the ideas and they have to create their own story with their own partner. So it's also kind of creative writing, um, imaginary writing. There is no framework. There is no idea. There is no prompt. They just have to use their own ideas to talk about those things. So this is a kind of creative writing. And um, for some teachers, they use such kind of creative writing in uh, pattern based learning as well. For example, if you teach the pattern, condition of pattern two, at that time, you just give like only the clause, half of the clause. If I won the lottery, da, 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 da. at that time, your students, they just have to start thinking like, oh, if I won the lottery, what could we do? At the time, they think like, ah, I would buy a big house. I would uh, donate some of my money to the orphanage. Like that, different types of ideas. They can start writing with their own way. Uh, the pattern also, they have to focus on that. But the ideas also, it's a little bit imagination, right? Kind of imagination. They have to think and create on their own way. We can also use this technique. Okay, so another one is writing as a cooperative activity. Um, it's on page 328, page number 328. Normally writing, how do we do writing in the classroom? Alone, right? Only one, only one student. At that time, the students feel really bored and they don't really want to continue it. And sometimes most of the teachers, you just give the topic to your student and then you just say like, okay, start from now. I will give you one hour to write. When you write that one, I will give you 45, uh, I will give you like only one hour. And then you have to write this one with 350 words. You just give the instruction like that and ask the students to write individually. At that time, how will the students feel? <laughs> they will feel bored, right? Because they have to think alone. They have no ideas, no words, and they don't really want to do it, especially for interpersonal type learner and kinesthetic learner. They don't want to do such kind of things alone. Maybe if you give homework, they might want to do, but now during the class hour, they don't really want to do that. So instead of working them alone, you can ask them as a cooperative activity. For example, uh, if you want them to write, it's okay, let them write, but maybe in groups or in pairs, uh, let them think about each of the part. For example, um, you are teaching about topic sentence and supporting ideas, right? Uh, about different types of writing based on one topic. At that time, your topic is only one, but for that one, when your students, they have to start writing. At that time, um, you ask them to divide into different areas. For example, your topic is like, um, health is wealth. Health is wealth. If your topic is that one, uh, there can be different sector, right? Why health is important for medical people? Why health is important for teachers? Why health is important for older people? Why health is important for industrial workers? Why health is important for, um, uh, how do you say, very young people? So different types of area. For that one, you can divide. And then uh, for each of the topic, you can give to each of the group. Okay, this group, please think about the idea. Why health is important for older people? And this group, think of the idea while, um, Good health is important for medical people. This group, why good health is important for teachers? Like that, different types of areas. And then they have to think about the ideas. And then if you think like individual individual topic, they will have some ideas and they are eager to, how to say, explore more ideas with some examples. They might come up with their own example. So it's also a kind of good practice for teaching topic centers and supporting ideas in an organized writing. Uh, maybe you have given them topic and then they, 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 they start thinking about their own ideas and they just start writing uh, some of the, how do you say, some of the facts and they get the ideas. You give like only 10 or 15 minutes. So after 10 or 15 minutes, you finish. Uh, okay, this group, you got one idea, right? Can you tell me your ideas? This group, this group, this group, group by group, they tell their own ideas. At first, with their group member, they have thought about only one thing. 
Now they have got a lot of ideas to write. Even if you don't have any ideas, now you're very happy to write because you 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 got a sort of ideas, a sort of opinion. So you just need to spend only 15 or 20 minutes at the beginning of the writing activity, and then you can ask them. Okay, now I think you have got enough idea. So it's time to start writing individually. Start from now, I will give you 40 minutes to write 350 words essay. At the time, they will be very happy. Even if you have no ideas, you have like some ideas with your friends already. And also you have like some vocabulary as well, set of words and vocabulary items. So I think it's really nice. If you're doing writing as a cooperative activity, it can be a kind of very engaging one and your students can also be very active. So let's try like that. And another one is writing, building a writing habit. That's the most important one. Actually, now also, right, we are trying to build our reading, reading habit. That's why I really want you to participate whenever we have the reading club on every Wednesday and Thursday. We will try to read. You don't need to be shy in front of the live section. It's okay. Uh, we are Myanmar. I'm Myanmar, you are Myanmar, we all are Myanmar people. <laughs> we don't have the very good accents and we don't have the very good pronunciation, but it's okay as we are teachers in front of the people, we have to be able to speak out, right? So next day, um, if we have the reading club session, please do join, okay? Um, <laughs> where are we now? We are on page number 329, right? Page number 329 is about building a writing habit. It's also very important for our students. Uh, since we were young, we teach, uh, we used to learn like different types of grammar pattern. And according to that pattern, we start writing little by little. That's why we feel really shy. And though we are afraid of people, and then we are afraid to speak out and we are afraid to start writing. Writing also, because writing is like, after we have written something, uh, how to say, everybody can see, right? Everybody can see and oh yeah, there are so many mistakes. The teacher also, whenever we check, we use the red marker and then we check with like different types of red marker. That's why the students can feel really afraid of you. So not to happen like that, what we can try is like, we can try to make balance between different types of activity. I think I have already talked about that one on glossary wall as well. If you have watched my glossary wall, you might remember that two types of writing, writing for learning and writing for writing. We can try to balance between these two approach. So the first one is writing for learning. Yeah, it's also very important to build their accuracy. For example, uh, we teach our students different types of pattern for giving request. Uh, like, uh, would you mind plus if I ing? Do you mind if I blah, blah, blah. Different types of request pattern. We teach our students like that. And then based on those pattern, they have to start uh, constructing their own sentence. Do you mind blah, blah, blah? Would you mind uh, blah, blah, blah? They just have to construct their own sentence. So after they have const constructed their own sentence, the teacher usually check, oh, you are great, you are great, you are great. So doing this one alone is not enough because by building their accuracy, they will have like uh, different types of grammar structure. Their grammar structures will be correct and then uh, they can write accurate use of grammar. They can write different types of vocabulary and grammar pattern in their writing, but it cannot help them to write, how to say, to improve their writing habit. If you really want your students to improve their writing habit, we need fluency skill. Writing for learning, writing for writing. Writing for writing means writing for fluency. Uh, for example, after the students have learned about those things, okay, this is one part. And another part we should practice with our student is a kind of journal writing or a kind of topic-based writing or uh, daily routines writing. For example, if your students are not very good at writing yet, you can start with a daily routine, kind of diary writing, diary writing. They just have to, at the end of the day, they just have to write what had happened to them. Oh, in the morning, I wake up at the blah, 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 blah. They, they just have to write about all activities from morning till at night. So they might excuse you, ah, this is every day. Now it's in COVID period. Every day is the same for us. So I think it's the same when we are writing. At that time, you can tell them like, no, even though the activity may be same, the way you write will be varied. I do believe in you. You just need to encourage them and let's start with little by little. 
So after you have practiced with them for two weeks with diary writing, uh, they, they, they have a sort of confidence. Firstly, they might write, uh, how do you say, one page. To be able to write one page, they might have to spend about uh, 30 minutes or one hour, it's for sure, because this is their first time, right? But later on, they, they, they will also get confidence in their writing. Uh, for example, they will start writing like, first day, one hour to just write one, uh, one page. And second day, also one hour. But starting from third day, uh, they can finish one page in 45 minutes. And fourth day, uh, they can finish that one in 20 minutes or 15 minutes. Like that, they can improve little by little. We cannot go from step one to step nine directly. We have to build their confidence little by little. One, two, three, four, step by step, we can go like this. So in this way, they, 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 they will get like a sort of fluent writing skill. And another one is we can ask them to write different types of journal writing, uh, the topic that may be interested for them, that may be interesting for them. For example, you can even start with the Korean movie I enjoy most, uh, the pet I like to have, uh, the application I want to use if I have time, Facebook or WhatsApp or a kind of um, photo editing software. And then uh, you can ask them to talk about their beloved person or you can even ask them to write about uh, how to say some of the some of the cooking or some of the creations they have made in their life. In this way, they can also do their fluency. So one part you are building their accuracy level. This is we call writing for learning. Background noise is so so bad, right? <laughs> Let's wait for a while because of the background noise. I think it's finished. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. Oh, okay. So another one is we also have to build our students' confidence fluency level, fluent writing skill level. This is like I told you before, uh, we can ask our students to do genre writing or a kind of topic-based writing on something. So if we are trying to build these two things at the same time, they will be really nice and they can improve both things at the same time. But one thing from the side of the teacher is when we are trying to uh, ask them to do fluent writing activity, don't try to correct everything. Uh, we teachers are really eager to uh, make corrections on everything, right? Uh, this is grammar is wrong. The vocabulary also is not correct. We usually try to point out our students' mistake. But at this time, we have to be patient. Instead of correcting their, their errors, we can, uh, how to say, we can give them encouragement on their contents only on their ideas, on their opinions only, not on their written work. So like that, we can try to build our students writing for writing skill and writing for learning skill. This is we call accuracy-based learning and fluency-based learning. If you really want to know about that, you can read page number 330 on your own. <laughs> so another part is role of the teacher. So when, when our students are doing writing, what could be our role? Uh, when I instead of become uh, when I instead of working as a teacher, I don't know about I don't know much about uh, teaching role. At that time, how I usually try is like I I give the topic to my student, especially for grade nine or grade ten students. And for them, they have to write about essay and letter, right? I just give them topic. They write on their own flow. Some people they are not very happy. And for me, I'm very happy when my students are writing because when they are doing their job, I can also do my job. <laughs> for example, if I haven't finished my lesson planning or if I haven't finished checking some of their answers, at that time, I try to spend by sitting down and then checking or checking things like that. <laughs> Actually, it's not a good habit, right? So when, we, when our students are writing something, we also have to take the role of the monitor. We have to go around the class and then um, don't, don't interrupt them, but uh, be there. You should be there if they are in need of help. So at that time, they, they know that, oh, the teacher is checking. And if we don't know something, if they don't know something, we are ready to help them. We can be a kind of support for them. We shouldn't be sitting in one side and we should go around, check, and then um, we should support if they are in need, like that. So on page number 331, 332, 337, and up to page number, 
up to page number three, four, two, you can find different types of writing activities. Writing is a really nice one because uh, we can try to create different types of activities. So please try to um, look at those pages and then you can uh, try to create some writing activities for online as well as in-person class. Okay, so now it's time to move to another unit. Another unit is how we are going to improve our students' speaking skill. That is on page number 343. The book we are reading now is called The Practice of English Language Teaching. Uh, now we are on chapter 20. Chapter 20 is about speaking. Okay, so speaking. If we talk about speaking, we have to consider three different things. We shouldn't forget these three things. The very first one is called accuracy. Everybody has already known about that, accuracy. Accuracy, like we have to be accurate in pronunciation. Sometimes, you know, um, most of our, how to say, Taihu's pronunciation influenced, right? For example, V-I-N-Y-L. Whenever we see the word V-I-N-Y-L, how do we say? V-I-N-Y, V-I-N-Y, or v like that, right? We used to make mistake and actually vinyl, vinyl. And then uh, another one is like V-E-H-I-C-L-E. We try to pronounce like vehicle, vehicle. Actually, how sound is silent in there? We have to pronounce like vehicle or vehicle for that carrot, but her sound has not been pronounced. So like that, since we were young, uh, most of our pronunciations were wrong. So as a teacher, we didn't know some of the pronunciations in a correct way. Till now, we I also have to still learn it. Some of my pronunciations are not correct yet. So at that time, we also have to learn everything. Uh, for example, when we start planning the lesson, we have to think about, especially for speaking, we have to think about three different factors, accuracy, fluency, and appropriacy. So the first one is like accuracy. Related to accuracy, uh, as I've told you before, we have to consider, we have to consider about our pronunciation. How do we have to pronounce it? And then what about the linking? How do we have to link the sound together? If we say like, would you mind opening the door? No way, right? Would you, would you, like, uh, how the sounds can be linked together and how can we pronounce the sound and how can we, uh, how to say, how can we say in a very, how to say, very, very uh, systematic way according to the structure. We have to learn about that. And another one is called fluency. When we are talking, sometimes some people, when they start speaking, it's like a robot. <laughs> Hello, good morning, everyone. I want to say this one as an example. If I'm saying like that, would you be interested in that? <laughs> no, right? We have to use our own accent, but we also have to use some of our strengths and we can also build uh, fluency. Fluency does not mean talking something or speaking something very fast. It means we try to speak naturally. We also have to help our students to speak naturally. But don't forget that if you want your students to speak naturally, the most important one is to have a lot of input section on listening. Only when they have them, how to say, listening power to something, maybe you can ask them to listen to tech talk or some authentic material. At that time, they will have confidence and they, 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 their exposure can help them to speak better. So it's really important. And another one is uh, appropriacy. Some students, their English is quite good. They can speak accurately and they can speak very fluently like the native speaker, but they don't know about appropriacy. Appropriacy is like speaking something formally or speaking something informally. So it's very important uh, because I have seen so many people who are using informal, uh, informal words in public speaking. Um, for example, when uh, they have to do presentation in front of a lot of people, some students, they usually start with, you know, you know, you know, every time you know. <laughs> Actually using different types of you know, using a lot of you know in sentence does not sound good, especially in British English, right? That's why we have to be careful about those things. We also need to focus on three different areas. Don't forget that accuracy, fluency, and appropriacy. And also another one mentioned in this book is page number 344, different types of conversational strategies. We have to consider that. The very first one is conversational rules and structures. For example, whenever you set up the group work and pair work to your student, at that time, what type of problems usually occur? Normally, 
the dominant learners usually try to influence, right? For example, if you make your students group with like four different people in one group, at that time, three students are normal, but one student is a little bit abnormal. He or she wants to influence someone a lot. At that time, uh, he only he talks about something. Whenever the other people give the suggestions or idea, he does not accept. And he wants to lead the conversation all the time. You give like, okay, 10 minutes for discussion. At that time, most of the discussion time will be taken by that student only. So at the time, the, the other students, they don't have a chance to say, or they don't have a chance to participate in the discussion. Not to happen like that, we can have conversational rules. Okay, when you are doing a pair work or group work activity, don't talk alone. Give an equal chance to everyone. We have to be fair and square in that area. We have to set up the rule as well. And also said students, they might have like some, um, some ideas. For example, in their group discussion, one student say one thing, but another student doesn't want to agree with that one. So at that time, uh, you can also ask that student. Okay, if you want to say something, if you want to say something you don't agree, don't say it directly. You can say with like, oh, sorry to interrupt you. I just want my ideas on blah, 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 blah. Like that, such kind of conversational rules and structures. You need to teach them ahead. If not, they can interrupt the other people's conversation and it's not a very good manner, especially when we are, when they are having like international conference or international meeting with different other people from the world. So it's very important. We also need to teach about this one. This is a kind of appropriacy as well appropriate language in appropriate situation. And another one is survival and repair strategies. Survival and repair strategies. It's very, very important, uh, especially for non-native speakers like, like us. We are Myanmar people, right? Sometimes we are lack of words. I, me too, right? While I'm talking to you, sometimes I'm lack of the words and I just use some of the words, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so your students also, if they are lack of words or if they don't have any words, do speak out. At that time, you can teach them like survival techniques. Survival technique is like you teach them kind of uh, hesitation fillers. We can say like hesitation fillers. For example, in the middle of their talking, they, 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 they are introducing themselves. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Susu. I'm talking to you. Blah, 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 blah. They stopped in the middle. No idea. At that time, some students, they feel really afraid. And some students, they are not, how to say, they are not looking at you. They are looking at the ceiling because they have no ideas. They are not looking at the audience as well because they are afraid of people. So at that time, you just teach them some survival strategies. Survival strategy is like, um, if they have no ideas, they can start saying, how shall I say, uh, you know, how can I say, I mean, what I mean is, like that actually those words are nothing, but it's really helpful. Why they are speaking out with those words, their brain is doing their own fashion. They are thinking about what, how to go on and what to go on. In this way, they don't feel shy. Your students won't feel shy. That's why, Whenever we talk about conversation and strategies, we have to consider about this one as well. Survival and repair strategies. If they are in trouble, how can we help our students? If they know those strategies, if they know those hesitation fillers a lot, it can be really helpful for them to speak out. And another one is real talk. Real talk, it's very important. Uh, this is also one of the conversational strategies. Uh, I have seen so many people, especially for those who are really good at grammar. So whenever they speak out something, they speak with like according to the very formal grammatical structure, <laughs> very formal one. They start with a very formal statement. Sometimes um, it's really trying to, it's really difficult to catch up what they are saying, right? If we are using two formal words and speaking, it doesn't sound good. But for those people who are really good at grammar, they try to speak out and they try to show their ability in using grammar. At the time, it's like robotic language. Sometimes even for the native speaker, they do not understand what you mean. <laughs> so it's really, so like that, real talk, the way we talk should be real, the way we talk should be authentic. It should be natural. And some people, they try to imitate the other uh, the native speaker and then they try to use raw sound. Especially we, Myanmar people, have our own accent. It's okay, we are Myanmar. We cannot be American or we cannot be British. Um, but we can have our own accent. If the other people, if you understand what I mean, I'm okay. 
whether my accent is like a British accent or American accent, it doesn't, it's not, how to say, we don't need to imitate them. It's fine. As long as you can communicate with the other people very well, I think your pronunciation is not that bad yet. So like that real talk, we shouldn't be using too much ra sound at the end. Some people, they use ra sound and some people, they are using uh, a lot of sa sound when they are talking about something. So we have to be considered about that. So what we are talking now is page number three, four, three, actually. Conversation and strategies. There are three different types of conversation and strategies. The very first one is conversational rules and structures. Uh, second one is survival and repair strategies. Those are very important to teach. And the last one is real talk, real talk. The students should not be talking like a robot. They can talk naturally according to their own accent or according to their own speech. Okay, so related to speaking, um, another one is um, different types of, how do you say, strategy that we can apply in our speaking section. So speaking, some people, they come and ask me like, hey, when we do speaking, do we, have to ask the students to learn everything by heart. Learning by heart? No, it does not help you. It does not help. Actually, the students, they might remember your dialogue very well. For example, how do you say this one in this situation? How do they this one in this situation? They might remember. They might remember every single word. But the way they speak is not, how do you say, it's not very natural. It's coming like a robot. If you say this one, you say this one, this one, this one. So learning by heart something is not valuable and it's not very good. So whatever, uh, whenever I teach my students, how I encourage is like to let them listen to different types of dialogues a lot. Let them listen. If they don't understand, it's okay. As long as they understand, um, they can be able to grab some of the pronunciation and they can get some valuable knowledge for that. So if you really want your students to improve their speaking, please do listening a lot. Let them do listening a lot. But when you choose the speaking material as well, there are two types of material, authentic material and non-authentic materials. So non-authentic material is like graded material. Uh, how do you say, it's really suitable for your students level. If your students are about intermediate B2 level, at that time, you can try to find on Google like uh, B2 level listening audio. At that time, there are so many graded materials which can be useful for your students. And then you can try to teach one after another. But for some teachers, they are not doing like that. They buy the series of books. For example, uh, suppose you are teaching like Speak Out, Speak Out uh, level one to level six. They bought those books. After that one finished, according to your students level, you can teach one after another. This is like non-authentic material. They are not authentic, but they can be very helpful for your students level, especially for building accuracy. Like I told you before in writing, we can try to build our students in two different areas. The first one is writing for learning and writing for writing. Here also write speaking. For speaking as well, you can apply this strategy again. The first one is speaking for learning and speaking for speaking. Speaking for learning is like you use the graded materials let the students listen. After they have listened to that one, they will be able to speak out loud. Sometimes uh, if you don't have speaking materials, um, you can uh, choose from YouTube or something like that. At the time, the students will start listening and then they will start speaking out the things like that. Uh, another one is greater, uh, how do you say, authentic material, right? Authentic material are also very helpful for your students because it's real, realistic but it can be higher than your student's level. For me also, whenever I choose some authentic material for my English learners, I choose a, a little bit higher than their level. I choose the listening text, which is a little bit higher than their level. In this way, um, they, they pay more attention to it. Sometimes they feel depressed, but uh, sometimes if I choose a material which is very interesting for them, they, even though they don't understand, they try to focus on their listening. And then after they have listened to that part, they can talk about this one back. So it's great, right? The students, they can also be very energetic and they can also be very happy after they have listened to what they want. Uh, they really want to listen to uh, some of the ideas about, um, how do you say, origami. If your students are interested in making origami, making arts and craft activity, try to choose the best YouTube video and then let them listen. After they have listened to that one, they can talk about that with their partner. 
in this way, they can get two things, right? Killing one butt with two stones. Killing one stone with two butts. <laughs> Killing two butts with one stone. So for example, by watching such kind of YouTube video, they can also improve their listening skill. They can improve their listening skill. And then they can get knowledge on what they are interested. If they are really interested in origami, it's sure they will definitely listen to that video again as much as they understand. And then if you put some speaking activities into that one, they can also improve their fluent speaking skill. That's why we can make balance between speaking for learning and speaking for speaking, make balance between them, accuracy-based listening and accuracy-based speaking and fluency-based speaking. We can build a bridge between them. So it's like that. And also on page number three, four, six, they also talk about a sort of reputation the value of reputation is really important because since we were young, how did we learn our Myanmar language? How did we acquire our Myanmar language? By listening and by repeating what the other people say, right? We don't have, we didn't have any words to say when we were young. At the time, we just try to imitate what our parents say. If parents say something, we try to listen and then we try to repeat after them. If they start saying like po 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 po, we we also repeat after them po 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 or things like that. So English also when we are learning English, it's important for us to have different types of reputation, especially for young learners. They need reputation, reputation, reputations a lot. But sometimes you know, if you are doing different types of reputation in one time, your students may feel really bored <laughs> because. Um, they, they, they are repeating after you, for example, C-A-T, cat, cat, C-A-T, cat, C-A-T, cat, C-A-T, cat. Their mouth is moving, but their mind is not working. So that's why too much repetition is not good. So you also need to make balance a little bit. And another one is small groups and big groups. Yeah, in communicative language teaching, now we are practicing CLT in almost every class, right? So we are not trying to focus on teacher-centered approach only. For example, one teacher is teaching in front of the class and the other students, they have to listen to you. Their attention is on you only. You are the distributor, you distribute something and your students absorb it and they try to apply it. No, this is not existing anymore. Nowadays, we are practicing different types of interaction technique. Uh, for example, in the classroom, we can try to have different types of group work and pair work. And then um, you can ask them to think about something and they discuss together and they're trying to solve the problem together. That's why it's really important to make pair work and group work interaction. Maybe some of your students don't really like to do in pairs or in groups, but finally they will really like it. At first they may not like it if they are not, how to say, um, familiar with this technique. But later on, they will get used to it and they will be really happy in making groups and making pair activities. It depends on the teacher if you can tell how you're going to make the students groups according to their ability, same group ability or different groups ability. It's on you. It depends on your students level, the students interest and your students nature and then and you. The teacher is also very important to make decision on that one. Okay, so another one is uh, rule of the teacher. It's very important speaking. So think about that. When you set up the lesson plan, when you set up the group work activity, at that time, your students, they are discussing something and then they're trying to think about one idea after another. At that time, how could your role be? Uh, where are you going to sit or where are you going to stand? Are you going to walk around or are you going to, how do you say, stick to one group and then just trying to monitor them? How will you do it? It depends on you and it depends on your activity type as well. I think you might remember when I talked to you about uh, different types of, how do you say, seating arrangement in glossary wall. I have already explained you about that. For example, some of the teachers, if you have like presentation section, you try to arrange the class in U shape, right? If it is in U shape, one student, they have to go to the front and then they start talking about uh, the topic on their own and the other people are the listener. So at that time, the teacher will be standing at the back and trying to look at the present, try to watch the prisoner, how he or she is doing. This is one way. 
we're not doing and we are not interrupting. Only at the end of the presentation section, we start trying to interrupt them by giving feedback or things like that. But if you're not arranging your class like that and you arrange like circle shape, group by group, okay, this is one group, one group, and one group. If you are arranging like that, and uh, if you ask them to do like some uh, discussion activities on their own, how could your rule be? Will you be standing like a robot in U shape? No, our rule is a different one at that time. If they are going to discuss something, we can just go around and then help them if they are in need of help. And then uh, you can also take notes about their common mistake in speaking. You're not going to interrupt them but you are going to, how do you say, make a note about your students' common mistake. Oh, most of my students, they are making mistake in this one. Oh, I think they don't know this one yet a lot. Uh, I think uh, some of my students are not participating. The students' behavior and also about the students, uh, how do you say, the students' uh, language areas as well, you can note down in every single point. So at the end of the activity, they start discussing and they start doing presentation on that. After all the sections have finished, you can uh, give them like overall feedback to everyone. Okay, I think uh, most of the people have made mistake in pronunciation, especially on this word, blah, 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 blah. You start explaining every single point in detail. And then you can also give some behaviors, motivational things. Uh, I think uh, when you are doing discussion, discussion, some of the people are not participating. Uh, next time, I don't want it, okay, blah, 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 like that, on behavior or on language area, whatever it is, you can give them some feedbacks on their work. So this is the role of the teacher. It depends on you. There is no exact role. Depending on your activity type, you can try to create in many different ways. So in this book also, you can find different types of activities if you are really interested. Um, the practice of English language teaching, page number 350 until page number hmm, until page number 363 you can find different types of interesting activities for speaking how we are going to establish speaking for different levels not only for young learners but also for adults as well you can find different types of useful activities on your own way that's why i really want you to participate in reading club come on everyone don't be shy and don't be afraid Okay, every Wednesday and every Saturday, 7.30 to 9.30, we are going to have different types of uh, section or reading club. So it's free for everyone and I really want you to participate in it. Because you know, um, if, I'm if only I'm reading and I'm talking to you, only I will be improved, right? So I want everybody to be improved together with me. We can read, and also we can talk about our ideas at the time, our speaking skill will be improved. At the same time, we can get some ideas from other people. Please come on teacher, every Saturday and Wednesday, please try to participate in our reading club, okay? I will give you the reading club schedule again, and then uh, you can have a look at it. So which topic will be in next section? You can read it and then you can try to participate in it. Some people, I know that some people, they say like, uh, detail, we are afraid of live section. We dare not talk in front of people. Don't do like that. Because, you know, yeah, some people, they say like, they are reading on their own way. Even if you're on reading on your own way, sometimes uh, you don't speak out, right? At that time, your knowledge will be disappeared in a very short way. So not to happen like that. We have to speak out and we have to talk about our own ideas and we can learn from each other. Okay, come on teachers, please try to keep on reading and then uh, don't forget your commitment because at the beginning, most people are telling me like, teacher, I will try to read everything. I will try to read every day, whatever it is, but you're not reading yet. Come on, next day, please come and join with me every Wednesday and uh, Saturday, 7.30 to 9.30. Let's try and learn together and let's try to improve together. Okay, thank you teacher, bye-bye.